All right, I'm sure we'll have a few more stragglers in, but I'm happy to see you all. Welcome to 440 Galleries Artist Talk. Today, I'm very pleased to have Amanda Michelle Brown. Her solo show is called Two Truths and a Lie. And we also have Fragment Fracture, the artwork in the project space with James Acevedo, Lee Blanchard, and Kay Sarantonio. So we're going to take a look at the installation, some of the fun we had installing. And um, I want to remind everyone just to stay muted while we're having the talk and then save your questions for the end because after I'm done asking my questions, then we'll open it to everyone to ask any questions that you like. And at that time, you can either type them in the chat or or you could type them in the chat all along, but then I'll refer them, I'll refer to them in the chat after, or you can just unmute and ask yourself after the formal questions have passed. Um, so Mich uh, Michelle, <laughs> Amanda, would you like to say anything about um, what's going on here with the confetti and the installation? Yeah, um, I was just looking at those initial installation shots and I was wondering if somehow the pile has gotten bigger instead of smaller over the course of the time it's been open. Maybe it's just gotten more fluffed, but I'm like, it's definitely seems, I'm looking over at it right now. I'm like, it seems bigger. Uh, but um, yeah, that piece has been really a fun experience. And I think it it's a good encapsulation of of the whole show just because um it's an interactive piece and so um I invite if you haven't been to the gallery yet I invite you to come in and kind of stick your hands in it kind of throw the confetti up kind of fluff it um if you're a child feel free to like fully dive into it that is happened at least three times today mm -hmm. um <laughs> and uh, um through the process of that it's been interesting to note my feelings and kind of observe the feelings of the people doing it like the people who are in the confetti are like really immersed especially the children um and having a great fun time um but then knowing as a, the person on the outside and as especially for parents who are watching their children um make a mess in an art gallery which nobody wants to <laughs> admit their child is doing um the the stress that they feel I think it kind of reflects that duality that I'm trying to get across with some of my work that I'm sure our questions later will will touch on but the the idea of um trying to uh having people come in and like mess for lack of a better word mess something up but also for us to then try to like make it back whole again, but knowing that each time there's a little less confetti, there's probably a little dirt now in there too. Um, and it, the the piece is forever changed anytime somebody, somebody touches it, but there's the idea of us wanting that control of us wanting to like push it back up into its like initial form. Uh, that's just been fairly fun to play with. <laughs> and watch people, other people play with. <laughs> so I do wanna say that um, we get to see some uh, lovely digital images of these pieces and uh, and here we go. This is, So these are some of the pieces Amanda chose for our talk today, but it doesn't compare to seeing the work in the gallery. So if you get a chance please stop by the gallery and see the work in person. So Amanda, let's get started. Congratulations on a wonderful show. Let's begin with your title, Two Truths and a Lie. Can you tell us why you chose this intriguing title? Yeah, so for those of you who don't know what Two Truths and a Lie is, um, it's actually kind of, it's a get to know you game that um, 
I, I first played in summer camp, but it's also a favorite of corporate America. If you've ever um, had a job where they're like, let's get to know your teammates. Um, and the, the whole premise is you introduce yourself and you present two things about you, like two fun facts that are true and one that is the lie. And then everybody kind of has to guess which one of those is the lie. Um, and I really liked the idea of that because um, number one, it's playful nature, but also the idea that like, um, how are we kind of playing that game with ourselves in our, in terms of our own personal identities and how we see ourselves? Like how often do we um, have this vision of who we are? And then instead of when something contradicts that, instead of being like, oh, maybe that's not exactly who I am or how I respond to things, we tend to craft a narrative around it um, or a reason around it that perhaps isn't entirely true. Um, so that's, and not necessarily, I feel like people see lie and see it inherently as negative. Um, I don't see it as that. I feel like a lot of times, at least the lies that we tell ourselves are self-preservation and, um, so I, I wanted to be able to have that like juxtaposition with something that was a little bit more playful, a little bit more light and um, just also a, a fun little childhood memory too. Thank you. Uh, so each piece in this show is fresh and vibrant and unique. I suspect it has to do with your approach to process. Can you talk about how this work is made? Yes, so I um, each piece I I go in completely uh, completely new without like an idea of what I want to have on there, not even a color palette. And I the way that so most of these pieces are primarily watercolor. The way that I use watercolor is by layering over on top of each other. So that requires you to kind of like lay down a pigment, wait until it dries lay down another pigment, wait till it dries. So it's it's a very drawn out process, although each of the steps can be relatively quick. Um, and so each time I like reapproach the piece, I'm coming at it um, and responding to the marks that were left before. So whether or not it was um, like just a single color or two colors or a color and some of this like spray paint element, um, I'm, I have, each of them has a moment or memory in mind. That's probably the only thing that like keeps it structured from, from step to step. And so I, I, with that in mind, I take that and then use that information, that like memory and respond to the piece in front of me. And so the reason why I enjoy this process is I like to have, um, I like how it mirrors the way that we reapproach our memories over time. Um, there's obviously like the way we first experience something, which is like the objective truth. But then as years pass, as we uh, think back on it, we it gets colored a little bit different, it, whether it's like sometimes it's nostalgia or uh, we actually realize something was like a sad moment rather than a happy one. Um, each, each time we reapproach that memory, you can have a different feeling um, attached to it. And so reapproaching it, the piece itself each time, um, I think really helps make sure that it's, it's grounded in that initial memory, but it feels fresh each time. Um, and then the like detail elements, kind of what I was talking about with the confetti, that's the, the control, the trying to like bring some sort of personal narrative to each um, each piece, trying to find that like structure in what is probably just a bunch of random things that happen to you. <laughs> Thank you. That's um, that that gives another layer of something to think about that you had to wait for each layer when it looks very spontaneous and free uh, until you get to the geometric piece that you didn't mention the medium for that. Can you talk about the geometric parts? Yeah, so those are um, done in Posca pens. And 
um, all done by hand. So um, it's usually typically the last thing I do on the piece. And um, it's actually a very like, no matter how like chaotic the rest of the piece is, it's actually usually a relatively calming meditative process. Um, and it's, it's like a good way, like a moment to synthesize what the rest of the piece is and a, a chance to respond to the piece as a whole. So again, I don't have like an idea necessarily of where things are going to go and how big the, the shape is going to be, um, the like detailed shape, but it kind of forms itself as I'm going through making those like tiny little marks. Yeah, I like how the marks are opaque, but then the shape that they form is transparent. So it's kind of mimicking the watercolor, <laughs> but not. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that leads me to my next question. I love the contrast of free flowing paint paired with the structured geometric geometric mark making. Can you speak about your sensibility in general? By this, I mean, what drew you to this way of working and how do you see it evolving in the future? Yeah, so um, part of the reason why I found myself doing this, having this process in the first place is um, with the watercolor, I really like how to me, it feels the most beautiful and the most true to itself when it's just kind of let go like it's able to pool it's able to like you have those moments where um more pigment kind of settles in one side than the other in moments of like luminosity where the colors below can kind of peek through I just love letting watercolor do its watercolor thing um and thinking of my materials as co-creators in the piece um but then if I if I let that go too far, if I'm just kind of the like, I don't know, vessel for the watercolor, um, then I feel like it doesn't have enough of my hand in it. And so the, in the same way that the detail element like symbolically represents control, it also within the process represents like control and the artist's hand and making something um, turning it into something a step beyond what it is. So um, that's kind of why I was drawn to it first. I was like, well, I could just go just make big washes, but it just didn't really feel right with what I, with what I wanted to say and with um, making art that was truly from me, because otherwise it would just feel like it was from the watercolor, which would be beautiful, but it wouldn't be what, it wouldn't be me and it wouldn't be my, my language. And uh, so where do you think you're headed next? I love how you, this is kind of your language. That, that's a great way to, to characterize it. So are you gonna continue with this language or is it going to? <laughs> yeah, I think um, if like, if it grew out of another way of working and it's gonna, continue or if like you're just going to continue to hone this particular way of doing it yeah I've actually been feeling more like I'm now I'm like trying to stick with the language metaphor and I don't know if I can <laughs> but um you're the, the <laughs> um I can do it I got it okay so um I feel like I, I really obviously still like where these are, but I'm I'm wanting to see if I'm able to speak the same language in a different voice. <laughs> um, so part of that is seeing how I can bring these pieces off the wall a little bit. And so I've been exploring um, ways of making, bringing these concepts to a three-dimensional space, whether or not it's the the installation piece like the confetti or um I've been learning how uh glass blowing and potentially um making pieces that um represent what I've been working on process wise into glass which has a very similar luminosity and vibrancy that watercolor has and but it's very hard I will tell you that it's something I've learned 
<laughs> um, <laughs> and just finding other ways of um like maybe it's not watercolor but how I, how can i um you know stay true to that um idea that the the media itself is part of a, a co-creator with me so kind of exploring other ways of doing that as well and then also just bringing in more elements to the watercolor too like we'll see where it, where it ends up you never know <laughs> like i said i'm just reacting to things and then seeing where it takes me <laughs> interesting to find out and i would love to see what you do with glass that sounds incredible um and so finally amanda i'm intrigued by your titles how does that process work and how do you see the work informed by the title for us as viewers yeah so um like i mentioned each of these pieces represents uh, a feeling, a memory, uh, incident, uh, experience, all of those things um, that I've had. I can't speak to what other people have experienced. So, but I feel like some of them, the, the essence of that experience can be a little bit more universal. And so I don't want to, I kind of use the titles to um, rather than explain what it is like this one is like joy, um, instead of being a little bit more prescriptive like that, I want to invoke it in a more nuanced way with the viewer. And I feel like my titles are how I do that in a subtle way. So, um, they, I like to use, uh, kind of like common idioms, like same time next week um there's one that's called I'd have to think about it um things that you hear people re regularly say in day-to-day -day, um and they they relate to the experience that I'm tapping into but perhaps can also um pull something out of the viewer as well if the piece hasn't totally gotten them there maybe the last like five percent the title can help um so that's why I, I like to keep them a little bit vague but hopefully interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I like that idea of, uh, you know, kind of sparking a universal experience with an everyday idiom. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you. And now we're going to move to fragment fracture. And we'll begin by taking a look at the work of James Asfado. Oh, I forgot the installation shots of the project space. So you get to see how this work uh, looks in relationship to each other. And now we'll look at James's work. So James, Congratulations. It's a pleasure to see your work in the project space. Let's begin talking about medium. Could you please tell us about how these pieces were made and is this typically how you work? Um, well, thank you. Well, first, um, I, you know, I'll mention that this is my first project show and it's been very exciting for me. So I hope it's the start of many more. Um, but everybody's been so nice and, and thank you all for, for all your support. But um, what I put in this, in this show are um, two, and I, I refer to these as drawings. I'm a painter and um, my method of working is really to do a lot of pre-work or preparation and generating ideas. And, um, and, and this is, is part of that. So it's typical in that way, but I do that in a lot of different ways. Um, the, there's an ink drawing and that's the, um, in India ink, that's the black and white one. And then there's some watercolors. The ink drawing is, um, well, I refer to it as a drawing, but the, the process I used there was I began by, um, I had this idea for a series that I've done, um, where I, before I, before I start the image making, I, I essentially rip up the paper. So those kind of, um, 
um, horizontal lines you, you see are, it's where the paper's been ripped, just torn apart. And then um, I would, I took the, looking at these parts, I, you know, I started generating the imagery and the imagery is, you know, this, the desk imagery. And I, I began drawing in ink and, um, and kind of like thinking, well, I mean, it's hard. To, and this is part of the idea is it's hard to relate. Well, what's the image going to be? But I created essentially these drawings um, or ink drawings. And then in it, when I, then I reassembled them and I reassembled them by gluing them with matte medium and reassembling the paper. <clears throat> so when you look at it, it looks like, well, you know, it's just like a big piece of paper, but it's actually made up of, of many little parts um, that have been cut out and then reassembled. And with the um, the watercolors, well, they are watercolors and, and it's not a process of cutting apart, but there's an analogous um, process I use of, of thinking about layers that, um, of how watercolor, if you put it on paper, uh, you let it dry, and then, <clears throat> then I can, um, you know, I put a, some other paper or towel paper on it and I lift off the color and this, the stain that remains, I then draw onto that or that generates an image um, and I work from there. And so the, the watercolors are made in what I think of as a similar way of um, assembling a lot of different pieces, fragments, um, to make the final image. And, and, and it's a way that I generate images or the thinking about where what I will do in my painting. Um, my paintings don't necessarily look exactly like this, but it is part of that building up to a painting. Um, Interesting, thank you. Uh, I love how each artist's work in the project space relates to one another's and uh, it and how it, they relate to the show's title, Fragment Fracture. Can you speak to this from your perspective? Um, yes. And, um, you know, when we were meeting, when the project artists were meeting, we, you know, we, we, we felt this um, similarity in our work um, and our work approach, um, though we have our different paths. Um, I do both consciously and unconsciously, you know, think about um, working in fragments. Um, I mean, for one, I, as, as far back as I can remember, I just always put things together in pieces and I would just respond to things and um, like, a, like a collage or an, as, an assemblage. So it seems very natural to me, but I also view this as, um, as an art making strategy to, um, to explore ideas, to generate ideas, to try to, um, um, you know, avoid, um, avoid the kind of ideas where, where I, you know, think in my mind, oh, I'm going to make a painting. And it's like, I'm going to try to make exactly the painting I see in my head. Um, you know, really, I, I want to be making a painting where I'm responding to when I'm painting, I'm letting it also um, kind of direct me and um, surprise me, I uncover, uncover something. So um, that's how I think about fragments. Um, if I bring together these different parts, what can I make of them? Um, and then the, um, you know, there, I think also as a, um, as a kind of idea um, that, um, I mean, I, I do think that our experience is very much like that. Um, many, we're seeing many things, we're thinking many things at the same time and we're putting them together and um, it, it's just to me a kind of amazing process that we um, are able to do that and derive meaning from that. And I'm not really sure how that happens. So um, to me, it poses a very basic kind of question about, um, about experience and my experience that I hope, um, well, I think we share. Thank you, interesting. Um, and that leads me to my next question. I'm struck by the mix of the homey charm of these very ordinary objects arranged in very deliberate 
potent compositions dramatized by shadows. Can you speak about your approach to composition and what these compositions suggest for you? I mean, you've talked a little bit about what, what the approach suggests. So yeah, could you elaborate a little bit? Um, with, you know, I call these my death series. Um, I have um, worked towards um, an idea of two things. Um, I mean, among many things, but two main things. Um, I call them in my death series, but then I have this other um, area that I call uh, the, the stages. Um, and to me, they represent an interior and exterior. The, the desk is the interior. It's like what is around me, say in my studio or in my home. And, and that's the, um, you know, the objects, you know, these are just the, ob literally the objects that are, are, are around me um, in the studio. And I also collect objects um, for this purpose and I respond to them and I um, am kind of a, um, a hoarder. I have boxes of things and um, I just respond to and I like to draw from. Um, that's the interior, but then, um, you know, I also do, uh, my, I have other work that um, is on the outside. Um, I respond to um, when I'm outside in the city um, that, um, you know, I think of these as um, the, the two poles of, um, of experience. Um, the interior um, is like the unconscious or what's in our head. And then the exterior is like what's um, it's on the outside and the um, interaction. Um, so th these are the two um, places or settings of my work. Um, and I can say that like what I'm trying to do now is kind of like put them together um, because I've, I have felt that they, um, it, it's bothered me that they, that they seem separate. Um, so right now my, my goal is to bring them together. And in the paintings that I'm doing now, um, that's what I'm working on. Oh, excellent. I was going to say, I feel like you're bringing them together in these. Yeah, some, I mean, that, that's when I would look at things, I would say, oh yeah, you know, this is kind of coming together um, in that way. And so th this is what has kind of, um, wh when I, when I look at a drawing and say, oh, I got something from this, that that's how it helps me. That's why I draw. Excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, again, it's important to go see these in person. They're really beautiful. So thank you, James. And now we're going to move on and take a look at the work of Lee Blanchard. Lee, congratulations on a beautiful show in the project space. Thank Your you. work is so intriguing and evocative. The first question I want to ask is, how were these pieces made? Uh, yeah, so um, these pieces were made, actually, it was quite spontaneous. Um, they, they're glitches on uh, my computer screen. That's how they, the original form that they came out in. And to be honest, I wasn't even creating art in that moment. So um, I love to invite a little bit of spontaneity in my work, but um, I got to say, this is probably the most spontaneous it's ever been. I was like, oh, okay, that's that's some art right there in front of me. And um, But to get it to the point where it looks now, I um, you know printed the images. They were originally very small and visually not quite there where I wanted them to be. They were a little hard. So um, through a process of, you know, scanning and printing um, and working with the image, kind of softening it up. And I got it to um, the place where I wanted it visually. Um, and ultimately they're printed, um, they're pigment prints and they're on um, bar tip paper. But um, yeah, just sort of an interesting um, process for me <laughs> to kind of be like surprised by, by the art. <laughs> You're so courageous. If my computer screen did that, I'd be crying. And 
book art. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was my first reaction. And then I was like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I, it, they're very rich and warm in, uh, in real life. Um, so again, I love how these work, uh, th these three works relate to James and Kay's work. Can you speak to how you see your work relating to the show's title and to the other work in the show? Um, yeah, so, you know, as James said, we had some great conversations when all three of us got together and um, we definitely felt like Fragment and Fracture were a big part of all of our pieces. Um, in terms of Fracture, I mean, that's pretty, um, I feel like obvious visually just because you know, whatever was there on the screen was literally fractured into these almost little slivers that were reassembled and um, created this abstract image. So um, fracture is definitely a big part of, of the pieces. And um, fragment, I feel like almost conceptually, like these three pieces to me feel like they could be almost just like little fragments of a bigger whole. Um, I kind of see them just working off one another and um, playing with one another. So um, yeah, the title really just, you know, I resonate with both of those words in these pieces. And um, and I think they apply to everyone else's work in the, in the project space as well. Um, I will say, you know, when we were all chatting, I feel like there's a word kept coming up between us and that was um, vibration. And there's definitely like a vibration in all of our works. And um, in mine, it's kind of like this glitchy humming vibration, but um, it's present in in everyone's work. And and um, that kind of leads me to the, the next thing that I think brings all of our work together is the fact that you really need to, um, I think it helps to see it in person and really get up close. There's so much detail um, in everyone's work and you can really see that kind of vibration and that humming when you um, even more so in person and when you see it up close. True, true. Um, so Lee, you seem to pull poetry from aspects of technology that some would consider glitches or mistakes. And this makes me curious about which came first. Are you primarily looking for certain qualities or do certain glitches inspire you? You spoke to this a little bit, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, or does it work both ways? And where is that leading you next? Um, yeah, that's a really that's a really good question. Um, for this series, it the glitch did come first. Um, the last Project Space show I had was um, these abstract works about um, kind of about grief and about a pet passing. Um, and so that one was, I had the feeling, I had the thought I wanted to say something. And for me, it was finding the way to communicate that visually. And that ended up being, um, you know, taking photographs, but without my lens. Um, that to me felt like the most honest way to kind of convey what I was feeling. Um, so it, it, it does go, um, both ways, definitely. Um, and it really just, I just kind of try to keep myself open to, um, you know, stumbling across the, you know, the things that happen. And then also just, if I'm feeling something tapping into that and trying to communicate it. So I think it goes back and forth and it really just depends on, you know, the mood I'm in, if I'm more in a kind of experimental, mood technically, or if I'm just really feeling something that I want to um, express. And um, in terms of what's next, um, my next big show will be in a, about a year from now. So right now I'm just kind of in experimental phase, just kind of trying to keep myself as open to, you know, feelings or glitches or, <laughs> you know, whatever happens, happens. So I'm just trying to kind of just experiment and then see which experiment leads to, you know, the next body of work. So that's where I'm at right now. Thank you so much, Lee. Uh, and I'm really curious to see what what's coming next. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so now that leads us to Kay Sarantonio. Let's look at 
her work, their work, excuse me. Thanks. So you could see these are um, many small pieces. So, okay, congratulations. This is an epic piece in an amazing show. Can you tell us about how this piece came about? How was it made? Thanks. Um, yeah, I've been a, um, a printmaker for a long time and have most of that time been working with sort of photo-based imagery. And uh, for this piece, I um, was drawing on like sort of personal family archive. Initially, I really took photos with the intention of making them into prints or I even staged photos with the figure for prints. Um, and these days I'm, I'm just sort of mining what is already um, existing in um, our like personal family collection, which has been a really cool new experience for me to work that way. Uh, so this is a screen print on tile. So it's a photo screen print. So I start with the photograph and add a, in order to get gradation with um, screen printing, there has to be a dot pattern or some sort of um, series of small shapes that make up the different tones. So I use Photoshop to add a half tone to this. And this was, I started working recently with larger half tone dots. Initially I had been sort of trained with like formal printmaking training to make that process look invisible or to make it disappear as much as possible. And more recently I'm interested in um, really making that visible. So I think if you can see the, the dots um, that make up the image in the closer ones. Uh, and then, so then I transferred the image um, onto a transparent sheet. I coat a screen with a photo emulsion, which is sort of like a glue and, that is photosensitive. And I put it on a light table. I expose that transparency to the screen, wash it, and the water washes away the areas where the image was not exposed. And that creates a stencil. So screen printing is a stencil-based process, and I'm sort of combining photography um, and stencil in this way. I then lay the tiles underneath the screens, pour ink onto the screen and ink that I like mixed, especially for this process. And I, with this piece, I used a bisque tile. Um, it, it's not, it's only been fired once. I didn't make the tiles myself um, and it was not fired again. So I used just a screen printing ink. That's sort of an all surface ink uh, and printed the tiles individually, labeled them in the back as a grid and then eventually put the image back together in pieces. So it was um, one image that I split into many, many pieces, put those pieces back together and many transparencies, created many screens, and then printed the screens individually, individual tiles, and then um, assembled the piece, sort of like a puzzle with, with rules at the end. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it's processy, yeah. Sorry, I hope that wasn't. No. That's, um... <laughs> Uh, exactly what I was asking because um, it gives us a sense of the process that you went through to to achieve this, and um, I feel like that's in the work also. So it's part of it. Um, you can see the like how the ink moves, like especially on these edges where there are sort of imperfections that that I think changes it from like just the digital image to showing the hand in it in some ways. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so all three artists work is very different in this show, but each artist seems to pivot around again the title fragment fracture. So how is uh, how do you see this fitting in with fragment fracture. Um, well, yeah, I actually have like some notes from our meeting as a group and um, I know we just like touched really well on some of the words that came up and I was just gonna like add some of them, which were in addition to like vibration and sound that like were things that kept coming up reverberation and preservation was were things that came up as well. And I think we also spoke as a group about some of the formal aspects that like all of us were using, at least in some of the work monochrome and line and some grid work. Um, and we were interested in like the areas of emptiness or lack in between spaces. Um, I think that kind of comes through in all of our work too at like the seams in some ways. Um, and yeah, we we're all sort of talking about how we translate our personal experiences 
into the work and that a lot of it is like both controlled and emotive at the same time. Uh, so yeah. And the combinations of fluidity and rigidity is on my notes too. For my work for this one, I think there's really a very literal fragmentation of, of the image and fracture of the image in that way also. And maybe like a more of a reference to the intensity of like the fracture and the experience of birth itself, I think would like also be like where I would push that a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that leads me to my next question. There are layers of meaning and message in this striking piece, and I wanted to give you a chance to speak about what this image and its fragmented presentation means to you and what you want the viewer to take away from it. Yeah, I mean, I'm so curious what how it's perceived, because when it, it's such a personal piece for me, I obviously have such a specific um, you know, experience of it. So I, I, it's, I am so, I'm not really sure um, what I would expect the viewer to take. And I think it would maybe depend on, on the viewer, what, what I would expect them to take, what I would hope them to, to see and, um, you know, what they would see. Um, but I took a few notes about this too. I think, so I'm, I'm interested in the space between image and object as like a printmaker, especially when print work is often very 2D. I'm like thinking about the tile as having like a weightiness and a thickness and about occupying that space between two and three dimensional. Um, and I think because my work is so heavily based around my thinking around gender, it's like maybe obvious that I'm uh, really interested in those like in-between spaces or like category, like things that, that occupy like no category or multiple categories. So I think that's sort of where I'm like formally thinking about like the use of that um, more than two dimensional object with the tile. And I'm, yeah, in my work in general, I think I'm exploring tension between visibility and exposure, like risk of exposure, specifically with the gender, queer parenthood and family life. And I guess I'm thinking of this work overall as a window into like a particular personal experience, but within the context of a particular political moment that we're in, in relation to reproductive rights and relationship to like gender expression and gender justice um, and queer and trans rights as well. So yeah, and then I guess for the tile too, I'm just thinking about evoking like the home, um, interior spaces, family spaces, and also with the meticulousness and tediousness of the process of creating it and assembling it, thinking of that as sort of reference to the work of like parents and caregivers in general. So hopefully there's something a viewer can relate to in one of those ways. Uh, I think uh, the it's all coming through really beautifully and, um, and the, at the same time, I mean, I asked you to to elaborate on that, but it is just a piece by itself, without you know specifically calling out any of those references. That's very beautiful and very impactful. So, thank you. Thanks. So, uh, thank you, artists. We're going to look in the chat and see what there is. So, uh, there's a question uh, for. Amanda from Catherine Oreck. Amanda, wondering if you think about scale, because looking at these, on the one hand, they make me think of what you might see under a microscope, or opposite that, something happening on a cosmic scale. Yeah, so um, I was actually talking to a visitor in the gallery about this today. Um, I, before I switched my major to art, I actually majored in biology for a hot minute um, and kept on, at one point, one of my uh, professors, her like final project for the class um, was to, we couldn't write a paper and we couldn't do a PowerPoint presentation. We had to take something that we learned and um, make, do something like a final project around that. And so I actually did a painting um, because I'd always like before going to college, I'd always like thought about being going into art school, but like obviously, you know, parents are never really too keen on that. So I was like, oh, I'll just go and like, I'll do biology. I love biology. Um, but my, my teacher actually ended up buying the painting. And then I was like, 
yeah, I'm switching my major. Uh, <laughs> much to my parents' dismay. Uh, they're they're over it now. They're fine. Um, but so there there is always that a little bit of the the micro in there. And I feel like the the coolest thing about like being inspired by things. Well, my my senior project when I was in art school was actually um all about like microscopic forms and I would take pictures with scanning electron microscopes. It was all really super fun. But part of the thing that I really liked about the, that visually was the macro micro, the idea that like the infinite can be contained in something so small that we can't even see it with our eye. Um, and it doesn't surprise me that it still kind of comes through in my work in a lot of ways, even though the, the work looks very different. I feel like that I'm exploring different juxtapositions. And I think that that is those two things are like the heart of of the world and so it's always going to come through no matter what in some way do you ever think about going bigger i do but it's hard to find watercolor paper that goes really big um but maybe all these fragmented fractured pieces with you know, maybe I just need to piece it together and some like from the project space. Yeah, find find my own way to do it and not be bound by the edges of the paper. We'll see. <laughs> I look forward to that. Um, so now we have a question from Amanda for Kay. I love your ongoing explorations in showing queer domesticity and how in this piece you've brought in more physical elements of the home with the tile. Do you have any plans to print on any other unexpected substrates? Oh man, I didn't and now I do. <laughs> that's such a good question. Um, I mean, I have printed on fabric quite a bit because that's very easy to do with screen printing. That's you know, another way that screen printing is commonly used, but um, but I haven't, I haven't, no, not like, not, not in the context of this particular series, but I am, I would be excited to think through that. So thank you. Uh, and so that's all that's in the chat. So I open it to the group who has questions for our artists. I see Lee's hand. Yeah, um, I had a question um, for Amanda. So I knew that your work dealt with memory um and I but I didn't know that you had like so much time between the watercolor like each layer and I just thought that was really interesting I feel like it adds to um the whole concept of memory and I was wondering like do you focus on one memory between each layer and um and so does that kind of like change each time you like re reapproach the piece um so each piece is a single, I approach it with a single memory in mind, and that's kind of the like through line for all of them. Um, but how I'm thinking about that memory may change um, depending on the day or what else has happened since then. Um, I mean, usually like it can, the difference between each layer can be anywhere from like a couple of hours from like morning and then it's dry by night and then I'm able to do another layer or um I get busy and then it's like weeks later and I can come back and completely reapproach it totally fresh um so that there's always that like time element of like what I'm currently feeling and what's currently happening um but I try to keep um a consistent uh core feeling a core element in there and that um is usually the like memory that I'm trying to dive into it's really interesting thank you uh I see Ellen's hand well at the risk of being long-winded I I have a lot of for all the artists first of all Amanda it's so interesting to hear your process because these seem so fresh and the idea that you wait, you know, a day or weeks to go back to it is kind of mind boggling. But 
Uh, also, I noticed that there are um, some, before you put the first wash on, sometimes there are other little marks that are underneath. And as someone who doesn't work with watercolor, but I can see, it's just interesting, like those little marks go down and then you come back later to put the first wash on. I'm just very curious. I mean, it's, it's um, I mean, le layers, it's wonderful the way the, <clears throat> the solo show and the project space really come together in that way, even though the work is very different because yours seems so immediately spontaneous and yet not, is what you're telling me. Yes. yes it is. <laughs> so are you thinking of when you say the initial mark, purple, the purple the ones? Purple yeah. Thingies oh. are, they're underneath everything. Um, in that case, I think it is. Um, so that's an acrylic and water mixture that I put okay. into like a little spritzer that never makes the same shape twice because okay. it always dries and cakes up. And then I'm like, ah, where did that <laughs> does whatever it wants. Um, so sometimes I'll do that. That'll be like the first mark I make, but sometimes it'll be in the middle or later on. Um, and I really like how it, the watercolor doesn't like the way that it layers on top of watercolor lays layers on top of watercolor is different than how it will layer on top of acrylic, um, especially like a watered down one. It has a little bit more of that, like acrylic shine that can come through. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not always like this is step one, this is step two, but, um, it does have a different, give a different vibe, I would say. Yeah. I'm just going to look at them very differently now, knowing that there are these spaces in between each layer, these, mm -hmm. the, the temporal space, if you will. So, I mean, I, all of this work make, makes me feel personally like a complete Luddite, but I didn't want to go um, move on to the project space if it's okay for me to, James, what you were talking about with your watercolor, I, it's like, I need you to say that again. I, how you, how you put these together. You said that they, that you use paper to, this one I understand, you know, now, I mean, I, I got that, but I'm just very curious about how you said that you would use blotting paper or did I completely misunderstand you? I mean, the uh, way it's, these it's, are constructed. It is blotted, but I actually just use bounty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, um, so you didn't create- I could another, use blotting paper. I could you use you, blotting You didn't paper. create another piece through the blotting. That's where I got confused. But I mean, just the 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 sheer, and of course I have to say to everybody, like, because I had the pleasure of interviewing James when he was uh, interested in joining the gallery, I've seen the breadth of his work, which is really mind boggling. Um, so this is just a little corner of what he does, but um, his, um, his pre your precision, is quite extraordinary and and um and yet there's a there's a there's a, a looseness and a tightness to this at the same time that's really very exciting so the precision is all an illusion <laughs> okay <laughs> um well but it it really is you know it's it's impressive that's all i can say it really is impressive and um and and I just, I mean, just to not take up too much time, then going on to Lee and her mind boggling, like Karen said, if that happened on my computer, I would just weep, whereas she has created art with it um, in a way that is, you know, uh, impossible for me really to understand. And yet I'm able to appreciate it very much. And her method of printmaking and then Kay's method of printmaking and Kay, I have a lot to say about your piece, as you can imagine, <laughs> um, having been, you know, pregnancy, having been so much part of my life. First of all, it's such a beautiful, beautiful photo. So it has all of that. And it's so dramatic. And it's, and, um, and I wondered, I mean, the tiles create a grid and the grid creates an illusion of a barred window. 
to me. And so I think there's, I don't, I don't know, Kay, if there's, I mean, it's like, what you were talking about in terms of gender identity and people's expectations and what um, what is considered acceptable and what's not acceptable. Am I reading too much into this? No, I think I think I use that um, element to like create some distance, a little bit of space that feels like oh, a little like self-protective. I think I think that is intentional that there's a little bit of um a, like something separating whether that's, you know, um, a physical barrier or not a reference to a physical barrier. It feels more than self-protective. It feels um, political in some way, um, at least for me. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's very powerful. I mean, this photo that otherwise is just like, you know, butterflies and, <laughs> and crystals, you know, has now been created to have a very, very different kind of meaning. So I, I just find all of this, I saw it for the first time yesterday, I, you know, came back from my trip and I was in the gallery and uh, it was just really exciting to be sitting with all of this work. And I apologize, Amanda, because I didn't understand about the confetti and a woman came in right at the end and needed to put her hands in the confetti. And I was like, excuse me, did you lose something? <laughs> I'm like, why are you messing with this confetti? I didn't say that. But, um, and then it was only later that I saw the sign that said, please touch. And I thought, oh, no, but she said I had a very hard day. I needed to come in and play with the confetti. That was fine, but uh, that, was my, that, was my, that was my bad. <laughs> yeah, you didn't get the the official blurb ahead i didn't of get the official time. blurb right or i didn't <laughs> tend to do it so uh i just have to say as somebody who experienced the work in person for the first time yesterday that yes not like this i didn't experience that um that it's it's very powerful and very interesting together and while it seems you know, Amanda's show seems very, very different from the project space, yet today I really understood the way in which they come together. So thank you. Now I will mute. Some more 440 magic. Uh, Catherine, I see you have a hand. Would you like to ask a question? Yeah, um, I just happened to have caught the last day of the uh, Cubism and the Trump Loy uh, tradition at the Met. And I, when I was standing there, I thought of James's work. And I was wondering if he had a chance to um, to see the show. Not that his work looks like either Trump Loy or um, or Cubism, but there were aspects of the space, the um, uh, putting together, you know, the, the tilted tabletops, um, the collage aspect of things. And there were just a lot of things that that um, came up in regards to his work. Um, I I missed the show though. My, my wife ran up there today because she said that she's going to get the catalog, but I do know the work. Um, and, and, and yes, that's, um, that is work that has influenced me. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call myself a cubist, but I think I've been very much influenced by um, by cubism. Um, but yes, that's 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 there. Um, yeah. Well, I just happened to think. You know, I was standing uh, there today, and I thought, well, we're going to be talking about yeah. James's work today, and they're just like you know the the attention to the shadows. Like shadows were a very big deal. Um, yes. Um, yeah, not that it looks like either of those things, but it was just, but there are some ideas behind it that, that sort of came to the fore. Yeah. And also the, um, you know, the uh, American painters that were, uh, you know, those trompe l'oeil paintings from mm -hmm. the 19th century, that, that, that type of work, um, 
And, yeah, and well, I'm, a, like, I, I'm a Juan Gris fan. I love it. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. There were some beautiful pieces. And yes. what was nice um, was there were, of course, things that, um, you know, I, you see what's here in, in New York, but there were pieces from, you know, Paris and yes. uh, and um, but I, but I also want to say your water. I, I'm not, you know, the Trump lawyer. I'm not that interested in yours are so much more beautiful than, um, you know, for me than those pieces. I like the delicacy and the transparency of um, your watercolors. Beautiful. Well, I'm sorry I missed the show, but um, we're going to get the catalog. My wife will show. <laughs> Uh, so are there any other questions, comments, anything to say? Then in that case, I think we've come to the end. Um, and thank you all for coming and thank you artists for talking about your beautiful work. And um, I want to mention that Kay has work from the same series in a show in Chelsea. The Field Projects Gallery is up through late February. And also in Virginia at the Target Gallery at the inside the Torpedo Factory Art Center in Alexandria. And that opens next week and is up through March. And, uh, and that's called Beyond the Frame. And I'm excited to say that Juliet Martin has an next solo show, and that's called I See You Falling Out of Love With Me. And that mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> until uh, March 11th, the March 12th, sorry, and the reception is on February 11th from four to six. So I hope everyone can be there. Um, and during that same time in the project space, we have uh, Above and Beyond with Gail Flannery, Joy Mackin, and Robin Roy. So lots to look forward to. So uh, thank you all, and I uh, look forward to our next talk. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. you yeah, thanks for the thank great you, questions. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Everybody. Great. Thank you.